Hey there, fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we discuss the use of theatrical church productions. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your church theater critic today as we appropriate some culture. So we are back from our Easter break. I hope you had a wonderful Easter, that you worshipped our risen Savior, spent some time with family, and maybe took in a show like maybe this one. What's on the outside that's supposed to be on the inside? Uh, I don't know what. Batman's underwear. Oh! <laughs> Fire on the mountain, run boys run. Devil's in the house with the rising sun. Chicken in the red pen, picking out dough. Credit where credit is due, Robin. A sinner she may be, but unattractive she's not. <laughs> You'll know more about that in a couple years, old chum. <laughs> Son of the Waynes, billionaire and sole heir to the Wayne fortune. Precisely, Robin, boy wonder. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my butler, Alfred. <laughs> Holy Cape Crusader, you're right. But what about what he said about Superman? I may not be Superman, I may not be Clark Kent, or even Tarzan, but always remember this. Tarzan wasn't a ladies' man. Superman never made any money to save the world from Solomon Grundy. And sometimes I just spare the world and never see another man like him. You're finished. Fat brain, leave these two. I just want this one. <laughs> Take them over there, string them up. <laughs> Holy lost causes, Catwoman. There's no hope now. They could cast him into the catacombs, and there would still always be a catalyst of hope. Just a small town girl, don't stop believing. Hold on to that feeling. Street lights. Could this be it for the Cape Crusader? Has he had his bat cooked for the last time? Will the Joker rule Gotham for all eternity and leave the people in a state of chaos and despair? Stay tuned. Same bat time, same bat channel. Holy sacrilege, Batman! That's Church on the Rock, who is famous or infamous for their Easter services that feature a production jam-packed with pop-cultural touchstones and sprinkled with just a dash of gospel presentation. They've done everything from Toy Story to Indiana Jones to Star Wars to Back to the Future. Flux capacitor! Fluxing! Engine ready! All right, Jesse, if my calculations are correct, when this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious stuff. Oh, 
Okay, Doc. All right, time circuit's on. Flux capacitor, fluxing. Engine running. Let's go, Jesse. We're ready. We're ready, Doc. Did somebody mention my name? Jesse, am I glad to see you? Great Scott! I thought there wasn't gonna be a future for you! Your future's whatever you make it, and I can make it a good one. Come on, everybody, let's stand! Was ice cold, placed in the tomb to save his soul. This son for them hood girls, the whole world straight masterpieces. Teaching about sin, forgiven the lost in the city. Got nailed on the cross of down, but now he's back and he's living. Girls hit you, hallelujah. Girls hit you, hallelujah. Girls hit you, hallelujah. Cause uptown faith gonna give it to you. Cause uptown faith gonna give it to you. Now, setting aside the question of execution, I'm in favor of the death penalty, though it's probably not necessary in this case, even though they did that to Back to the Future, the real question is purpose, not quality. Why does Church on the Rock put out these sorts of productions, and is there some validity in it? Well, let's hear directly from them. Well, we might be a little different. Easter at Church of the Rock is a production. It's ready, set, go, lights, camera, action. You never know whether it's going to be Star Wars or Avengers or whatever is happening. We put on an all holds let go and we are going to make it happen with a story of Easter that is put in a way that you've never seen before. You would not believe the amount of work that goes into this. From building these incredible sets, sometimes it's like a ship or sometimes it's Pastor Mark swinging from the back in his Superman suit. You never know what's gonna happen. All, almost all volunteer hours of people building sets, making costumes, doing all these things. All of it takes a lot of work, but all of it is focused because we feel this is the pinnacle of our Christian experience. The Easter presentation is actually a great thing for our blessed lifestyle because you think of blessed, it's all about building relationship, You know, beginning with prayer, listening, eating together, sharing your story. But the one thing that it doesn't do is that it actually doesn't share Jesus' story. And that's actually where if you invite a friend to our great Easter play coming up, Murder on the Jerusalem Express, they will actually hear the Jesus story, which is of course how people come to a knowledge of Jesus. And what could be better than that? As a church, you know that we have talked about bless and we've talked about how what it means to have all of us um, be involved in the kingdom and in, in having people come and experience Jesus and, and know what this is all about. So really what it is at Easter time, the perfect time to say, hey, come out and join us for an Easter celebration that maybe you've never experienced before. I'm quite sure you've never experienced before. And you can come and be a part of it. It really is a time that you're gonna enjoy. You're gonna enjoy the music, you're gonna enjoy the acting, the set's amazing, all of this stuff. And you're gonna hear something that is gonna be very significant for you. So to have that kind of call to people who maybe wouldn't normally come, it's sort of that easy pathway in. We always get dozens and dozens of people that are interested in these newcomer classes right after Easter. So we have the Alpha program. And uh, the Alpha program is for those that are new to the Christian faith. And you actually get food as well. And uh, so it's 11 weeks of going through the basics of Christianity. And it is a great place to introduce people to the gospel. Our church is actually filled with people who got their first taste of church and the gospel in a way that didn't seem like super religious was right here at these Easter uh, times where they connect with uh, them in a way that allows them to understand it for the first time. We hear this over and over again, stories of people who say, this was my first time and when I came in Easter and then I began my spiritual journey. Okay. 
So I think a lot of Christians will look askance at those productions, but you can understand the thought process here. Because the fact of the matter is, it's not terribly different in principle to what many, and I would dare say most churches do, when it comes to an Easter service. We all recognize that Easter is one of the few services in which unchurched people will enter into the doors of a church, and we tend to seize that opportunity to evangelize. And so the Easter services tend to be geared to or influenced by unchurched non-believers. Our church services might not be as infotainment-y or crass, but the principle is still the same. We know unchurched people will be here, and so we make it a point of emphasis to be more evangelical and put out a clear, simple, digestible gospel presentation. Milk, not meat. It tends to be outward focused, and we do that in many, many ways. We modify our language a little less on the Christianese and strip out the more theological jargon, putting things in layman's terms. We over-explain things, being mindful to not just casually reference things or assume that people know what we're talking about. And that's a good and appropriate thing. You should be mindful of your audience. I remember an American pastor who came to Japan And he was giving a sermon, and it was being translated, and the pastor said, When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and the translator starts translating, but he's going on and on and on, and the pastor starts getting a little annoyed and goes, Hey, what's the deal? You're you're clearly not saying what I'm saying. And the translator explains to him, These people don't know who Moses is. They don't know who the Israelites are. They don't know why they were in Egypt or why they're being led out. It is absolutely important to recognize your audience and to speak their language. And these sorts of church productions are an extension of that idea. They are attempting to use the language of the culture, songs, movies, cultural touchstones, to present the gospel. In theory, that's not a bad idea, and the intention is a good one. But I think there are several fundamental problems with this approach. Number one, and this is a much broader problem, it confuses the purpose of church. A lot of churches miss the mark on this. The primary purpose of church is not evangelism. The primary audience of church is not unbelievers. That is not what it is primarily for, and it's not who it is primarily for. Church is primarily for believers, and the purpose of church is centered on believers. It is to encourage believers. It is to edify believers. It is to train and instruct believers. It is to grow and mature believers. That is the primary function of church. That's what it's for. Now, that doesn't mean that non-believers are forbidden to come to our services, and it also doesn't mean that they can't be evangelized to by coming to our services or be edified by coming to our services. And in fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Tongues, then, are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers but for believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. That acknowledges that unbelievers might be among you and that they can be impacted by what's transpiring at our services. So it's not impermissible or anything, but the primary purpose of church is still for believers because it is a mechanism by which we train, mature, and grow as believers, which is the point. In principle, training, maturing, growing happens inside the church. Evangelism happens outside the church. And when the function of church becomes superseded by evangelism, two really bad things happen. One, the believers in the church don't grow. They don't mature. They remain infantile. And that has all kinds of deleterious effects. Is any deep, mature Christian looking at Batman and thinking, oh man, that's really challenging. That's convicting. I'm really growing in the depths and understanding of God. I doubt it. Number two, it outsources evangelism. It trains us to think that it's the job of the pastor to evangelize and reduces evangelism to invite your neighbor to church. Why? Because that's how they could hear the gospel. Or, and I'm just spitballing here, maybe you could share the gospel with your neighbor. I mean, you're already talking to them, and you're the one with a relationship with them. 
Now, this doesn't mean that you can't have a few services in the calendar year that are more geared and more dedicated to the unchurched and to non-believers. You can. And maybe Easter is the perfect Sunday for that, since so many people who don't normally attend church might show up. And maybe that's all Church on the Rock is attempting. But even so, I still don't like it. You know that I'm in favor of the church and Christians engaging in the culture, but I think we do that by making art in the marketplace. They're not making art in the marketplace. They're making references in the church. And that's just kind of lame and embarrassing. Instead of repackaging other people's work, how about we actually create our own? That seems to me to be a far more worthwhile attempt at cultural engagement. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm against referencing pop culture in a church service or using movie clips or song bits in a sermon illustration or something. No, that can be a useful form of training for mature believers even. And that is one useful thing about these productions is they actually do demonstrate how everything can be used as a vehicle to share the gospel. But if you can use pop culture as a springboard to present the gospel, why does that have to be in a church setting or a church production? Instead of inviting people to church, how about inviting them out to a movie? Cut out the middleman. Just like sermon illustrations, use these pop cultural elements as a means to point people to God. That's a worthwhile thing. We just don't need bad church productions to do it. All right, that'll do for today. As usual, if you like what we're doing here, like, subscribe, share, and review. Be sure to buy my original creative work, Six Rounds for the Witching Hour, leave a five-star review, follow me on the major socials, join my author's Facebook page, and I'll see you next time for more Appropriate in the Culture.